Hi guys, it's Joe here from STEM Crew. Uh, welcome to the National Marine Aquarium. Uh, this lesson today is in conjunction with Sail GP Team GBR, and we're really lucky to be hosted by the uh, Ocean Conservation Trust. Yes, good morning, my name's Esther, and I work here at the Ocean Conservation Trust at the wonderful National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. My role involves lots of different things, including taking care of the animals, starving the tanks, feeding the fish, and keeping everything nice and clean. We're also involved in lots of habitat restoration projects, which we'll learn a little bit more about later. And of course, science communication, which is all about telling wonderful people like you about my favourite subject, science. So, today's lesson, we're going to focus on three different objectives. The first one is we're going to find out about the structure of seagrass. The second thing we're going to find out about is how seagrass photosynthesizes and the chemical reaction. And finally, we're going to find out about the factors that can affect the growth and amount of photosynthesis that can take place in seagrass. To kick us off, we're going to introduce you uh, to our very special friend, Seagrass, with a little video to tell you a little bit more about this wonderful habitat. Hello, it's me, Seagrass. It's great to meet you. You may not realise it, but we're neighbours, you and I. Some people think I'm a seaweed, but I'm not. I'm actually a very special kind of plant. I've been on the planet for a long, long time, since dinosaurs walked the Earth. In fact, I'm the oldest living thing on the planet. In the beginning, I lived on land just like you. I didn't look all that different from the plants and flowers you see every day. But I was unique. I adapted. I moved into the ocean and I have lived here ever since. I like to live at the bottom of the sea, in sheltered bays and estuaries. My favourite place is shallow waters where I can be close to the sunlight. It can get really busy down here. A whole bunch of weird and wonderful creatures like to visit me. For some of them, I am food, or a place to find it. A hiding spot from predators, or somewhere to raise their young. Some stop by for just a short while. Others stay for life. I'm a good neighbour to have. I make the coastline a safer place to live by steadying the seabed and stopping the shore from being washed away by big storms. Baby fish use my shelter to grow big and strong. And guess who eats the adult fish? That's right, you. And I take carbon from the sky and give back oxygen, which you need to breathe. But lately, I'm getting worried. In the UK and all across the world, I'm disappearing fast, faster than any other habitat on the planet. Pollution and disease stop me from growing. Dredging and marine equipment drag along the seabed, ripping apart my fragile leaves. Climate change is altering the waters I need to survive. Most people don't even know I'm in trouble. I understand why living out in the ocean makes me hard to see. But if I disappear, I'll be gone for good. Then, who will look after our ocean friends? Who will look after you? Wow, what a brilliant video that was. It's so, much, so great to find out so much about the life of seagrass. I thought seagrass was quite a common thing, as. Well, actually, seagrass is having a lot of issues from the environment and is actually quite threatened. So although you might think that it's much like seaweed that you would see all over our oceans, gets washed up in storms, um, it's very different. We've got some seaweed here, which you're probably very familiar with. Yeah, okay. Any ideas on the, the species of this one? I've got no idea. This one's know. egg rack, much like blad rack, these nice big bladders which help float the blades up to the surface so it can make its food in the ocean. Nice. But as you can see at the base here, seaweed has hold fasts. They don't have a true root system. And that's how they ground themselves in the ocean with a hold fast onto rocks rather than a true root system. 
Whereas seagrass is actually a true plant. It's got a complex root system, long leaves that grow at this one point, and it's the only underwater flowering plant that exists. What really makes it unique is this large rhizome combining the entire plant habitat under the sea floor. And that makes it this true plant system with a root system underneath. So very different to sea seaweed. Oh, okay. So is it not that common then? No, it's, it's actually quite under threat. There's a lot of environmental factors affecting seagrass and its development and growth which is why lots of different projects are underway to restore those essential seagrass habitats, like the one that we're doing here at the Ocean Conservation Trust. Okay, so can you show me how you actually did that? Yeah, so seagrass is normally rooted in the seafloor under the sand with that complex rhizome out of sight. Unfortunately, due to environmental factors we'll be telling you about shortly, they're under threat and those seagrass habitats are reducing. So what we've been trying to do is to plant out more grass, much like you would on a lawn or a field. The complexity is, this time, we're planting plants under the ocean. This looks awesome, this setup. <laughs> so what we needed to do first was to get some seagrass seeds to plant. We went to some healthy seagrass beds, harvested lots of seagrass plant from those healthy beds, allowed the material to rot down, and what you get left with are the seagrass seeds, which we've allowed to dry out ready for planting. Okay, Next, so do you just go and chuck those in the ocean like that? Well, if you were to just sprinkle them into the water column, they'd most likely become food for local animals in the habitat uh, okay. or carried away by ocean currents. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. What you need to do is get yourself a biodegradable hessian sack which were locally made and we were very lucky to have an army of volunteers to help us out with the next step. What we did is filled these sacks with some ballast, so in this case some sand and natural sediment that you'd find in the local habitat. How come you needed sand and stuff? So this isn't actually to provide the nutrient for the growing plant. This is simply to weigh the bag to the sea floor so that when we drop this bag to the sea floor, it provides a nice protected area for those seeds to germinate. So what we needed to do is secure the bag. This was the bit that took the time. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I can imagine having to do loads of these must have taken ages. But once you've got that, there's your little seed bag ready to deploy on the sea floor. And those seeds are now in that nice protected area, free from environmental um, disturbance from animals eating it or being carried away because it's nice and weighted. And that will fall to the sea floor allow for that time for those seeds to start to germinate, root down into the seafloor, and then that bag will biodegrade from UV light and environmental factors and rot away harmlessly, and that plant can then be ready to start that new seagrass bed. Nice, so it's a little, uh, little bag to take it out. Is this, is, is this just the only way you, is it only underwater that we can do this sort of thing? No, definitely not. I mean, planting plants is a brilliant way to um, do your part for the environment, and also it's really, really fun. If you like quick results, um, your best bet is to start with something like cress. I mean, here's some I just made the other day, and already you can see some really wow. well-developed plants here. Um, and they're really straightforward. You don't have to have soil like I put in here. You can even just use some kitchen towel. All you need to do is wet your kitchen towel. That's, of course, a very important part of it. We didn't need to add water to our seagrass seeds because they were going in the sea. Yeah, fine. Plenty of water. Um, then you're going to get your cress seeds. I say cress because as they've got a very fast germinating rate and don't require too much resources. You don't even need soil, as I say. No, they're super speedy, aren't they? Yeah, and once they're wet, place those somewhere warm um, with quite a lot of light. And within a few days, you'll already see the seeds start to germinate and then start growing out their first little shoots and seedlings. And with enough light, they'll develop into the full cress plant. Now, that's quite basic and very easy to do, no matter what your age, whatever your resources, just grab yourself some seeds. If you want to not have to buy seeds, you can even extract them from your fruits and vegetables. So maybe you've got some tomatoes or a bell pepper, um, and you can try planting those out into a pot to make your own kitchen garden. So what about if we wanted to try something a little bit tougher, you know, like something a bit more 
edible. I mean, I love cress, but I could do with something a little bit bigger. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. So if you want to buy seeds or, as I say, extract them from some veg, um, you're just going to need a bit of soil this time because these are going to be a little bit more complicated than the cress. So place your compost or even some soil from your garden into your pot and about an inch or so from the surface so that they're protected from animals and birds. Sprinkle your seeds. In this case, you've chosen some spinach. Or pie. <laughs> Central iron. Um, fill it up with some soil onto the surface. And then, of course, you know what we need to add? It's some water. water. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all you need to do is place that one on your windowsill and wait for it to germinate. Nice. Um, so there's a few little things that I've, uh, tips that I've used before, is that if we don't actually have any of these really nice pots, uh, you can take a old water bottle, a Lucas Aid bottle or anything, chop it in half um, and then use the bottom of that to make a container. What you want to do is pop some holes in the bottom of it though, because otherwise the rock bottom of the roots will begin to rot because the water will just sit there. Um, another tip is actually on the back of these um, seed packets, there's some really useful information. It tells you when you need to sow your seeds, but also how deep in the soil you need to sow them and how often it needs to be watered. They also, some of them like to adhere to social distancing and be really spread apart, but some of them you need to, you can grow much closer together. So it's really worth having a look at the information on the back of the pack. If you'd like to have a go doing this um, further afield, maybe filling your garden or on a local grassy verge or conservation area, and you just want to plant seeds everywhere, a really great way to do that and protecting them from birds eating them is with seed bombs. Seed bombs can be quite small, like this, or you can make them larger depending what area you want to spread them over. So what you do is, this time it's gonna get a little bit messier, and you want to mix with your soil, your compost, you want to add a little bit of flour. And you want to add the flour in a ratio of two to one soil to flour. Once you've got your soil and your flour in there, and you can mix those in together, you're going to need to add your seeds. In this case, um, you can get a variety of vegetable seeds. I'm going to have some sunflower seeds. Sprinkle in your seeds that you want. Whatever you're going to grow. Some pumpkin seeds in there. And let's add some of Joe's spinach as well. Nice. So Once you've the... got all your dry ingredients mixed in together, we're going to need to add that water. What's the flour for? So the flour is what's going to create that sort of paste as it mixes with the water. And you just keep adding the water until you start getting a bit of a combined effect. It's not an exact science in this case because it will depend on the volume that you're making if you're making lots of seed bombs at once. Once you start getting a bit of moisture in there, that's where you can start getting really messy, get involved. And as you can nice. see, that flour combined with the water makes it a little bit more claggy. And what that's going to do is make a paste which will keep all those seeds in together and protect them from being eaten. So this is where you start to get really muddy, get moulding. And once you've got a nice moulded ball of that flour paste and soil, you can see my seeds in there distributed through it, you're going to want to set that. So you take some dry peat or dry compost and you're just going to roll your dry compost and soil Dry, your, your seed bomb into that soil and leave that to dry and what you'll end up with is a nice solid little seed bomb here's some smaller ones that I've made earlier they dry so they won't make your hands dirty once you come to, to plant them out and what you want to do is to deploy those so throw your seed bomb somewhere where you want it to grow so, so those, those seeds are protected inside that little unit there and they'll germinate without any interference from animals um, and then root them down in the soil just like they did with our seagrass in the seagrass bag. But what you want to make sure is that you do throw them somewhere where they're going to get quite a lot of light and Joe's going to explain to us why. Yeah and my absolute top tip of the week is earlier I made the mistake of thinking these were a nice tasty chocolatey treat. They're not. Don't eat them, they taste horrible. So, we're now gonna have a little look at 
how photosynthesis takes place. Now, photosynthesis is a reasonably complicated chemical reaction. Um, so, as it's a chemical reaction, it has inputs and it has outputs. So, this all takes place inside either plants or photosynthetic organisms. We have two things that go in. First of all, we have carbon dioxide. We also have water, which is shown. These are the chemical formulas for each of them. Carbon dioxide, one carbon molecule, two oxygens, and then water, we've got two hydrogens and one oxygen. So when these two meet in the cell, in the presence of light, a reaction takes place. Now this reaction is, in essence, photosynthesis. The two outputs then come out, and these are the really interesting bits. What we have is this super equation, a uh, super chemical formula, which is C6, H12, O6, and this represents glucose. This is the form uh, of sugars that the plant can use to, uh, for growth and repair. The other byproduct, which is actually useful for us, uh, is, oh, that's supposed to be a plus, not a times, is oxygen. And these, because there's two of these oxygens, they like to go around in pairs. This is really useful for us because we respire and we use this oxygen for creating our energy inside a human. Um, so it's a wonderful process that uh, balance between humans and plants and re other respiring mammals or animals that res have respiration taking place. Um, what's really important though is that these things, these inputs can be affected. We can change the amount, either the amount of sunlight or light that's given to the plant or the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this can take, make a massive effect on the amount so that this plant can photosynthesize. And that's what we're going to find out about next. Um, we've set up a load of different experiments which take us through a bit about, a bit more about how we can affect those factors of photosynthesis. So, S, what have we got? Yes, what we've done is we've set up an experiment that would be really easy to replicate in a school laboratory um, and be able to get results within a short period of time because instead of using seagrass we are using a very fast oxygenating plant this freshwater plant called pondweed or elodia and what that means is it will replicate the same idea and the impacts that are affecting seagrass but with a measurable result in a set time this is our standard control which has a controlled amount of seagrass at the pondweed which is representing our seagrass in a closed system which has been exposed to a set amount of light over a set period of time and left to photosynthesize. And much like seagrass, producing our essential oxygen for the planet, a really important role on our Earth for our life and all living things, the Elodia, as you can see, has also been respiring, producing quite a large volume of oxygen. This one is just over 30 centimetres cubed in our given time. Wow. That's really impressive. So it's literally, we can see how that oxygen is being given off from photosynthesis. And we've got a game for you guys at home next. Um, it's called Seagrass, Higher or Lower. It's going to be a good game, good game. So let's get started. So the rules of the game. We're going to compare the next example to the one before it. So for this one here, we're going to say, has this one got higher amounts of oxygen given off or lower amounts of oxygen given off compared to the previous one? We're going to go all the way along and you guys are going to get to have a go at home. So, what we need to do. First one, S, what's going on here then? So, this experimental setup is representing anchor damage, our first problem that is affecting seagrass. In this example, you can see that the sample of Elodia that we're using is much, much smaller than in our control. This is representing the destruction of seagrass beds by anchor usage as they're dropped on those essential areas, ploughing up the plant and cutting it down, significantly reducing the photosynthesizing area of the plant. 
Brilliant. Okay, so um, let's find out. Is it higher or lower? Have we got more oxygen than our standard result here that had about 30 centimetres cubed of oxygen given off in the time? Has it got more or less? Has it got higher or lower amounts of oxygen? Let's find out. Wow. I mean, there's, there's barely any has been made there. How, why is that? So we only have less than 10 centimetres cubed of oxygen produced. Again, because of the significantly reduced size of the plant, there's much less area to be photosynthesizing. So the volume of oxygen produced is much higher, uh, okay. much lower. Unfortunately, this is something that's happening in seagrass beds across the world. Sure, okay. So let's move on to the next one. It's seagrass higher or lower. We're going to find out, um, so, uh, this is something to do with uh, fertilizers? Yeah, so what we're doing here is m mimicking or modeling the effect of industrial um, farming methods which use uh, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium fertilizers to speed up the growth of the agriculture of the plants uh, by enriching the soil with these um, nutrients that the plant needs. Okay. It looks horrible. It looks like my bath water yeah. is green. So what's actually happened here is um, an overgrowth of algae. Because of those fertilisers that have been added to the water or running off those fields, that algae has grown. And what we've done is to replicate that addition of fertiliser runoff from the fields, we've added algae to this example of the experiment to mimic that effect. Okay, so uh, this is going to be tricky. Um, Try at home again. Um, if you need to, pause the video so you can have some uh, guesses of what it's going to be. Um, is it going to be higher or lower? Let's have a look. Has it produced more or less oxygen? And wow, it's produced loads. So does that mean the the algae in there is helping the seagrass produce oxygen? Not quite. That is the impression that you might get. But what's actually happening here is that algae is a plant too and is also photosynthesizing, producing oxygen. And that's the effect that we're seeing here. A large volume of oxygen being produced by that overgrowth of algae. Unfortunately, this isn't a positive effect because that algae is smothering the seagrass, or in this case, the pondweed, um, and preventing it receiving the nutrients that it needs and preventing it getting that light. So that eutrophication is a big issue for our seagrass beds. Right, okay. So we've got what looks like quite a lot of oxygen made that actually isn't by the seagulls, but we're going to go with that's at 40 at the moment. We're moving on to another one now. Um, this looks like my old friend sedimentation. Yeah. Um, what's going on here? So this one is modelling the effect of erosion. Erosion by uh, rivers and waterways washing sediment into the ocean and uh, affecting the turbidity of the water. So lots of, you can see our pondweed sample there, which was the same size as the control, is being um, smothered by that sediment in the water. Okay, so it's really muddy and some can't get in there. Right, okay, so is it gonna be higher or lower? Are we gonna have produced more oxygen by photosynthesis in this example or less? Let's find out. We're gonna unveil it, exciting. So it is, oh. Oh, there's not a lot made there. It's just about 15, 20. That's not a lot of, not a lot of oxygen made. So is that because of the mud in the bottom? Yeah, exactly. So that increased sediment in the water from that erosion in this model is having the same effect on the elodia as it would do on our seagrass habitats, preventing light penetrating to those depths and preventing it from photosynthesizing, producing that essential oxygen and trapping in that carbon dioxide. So sedimentation and erosion is a big issue for our seagrass habitat. Right, okay. So let's go on to the next one. Wow, this looks like uh, a Minecraft ocean with some really paying filters on. Um, what's going on here then? Well, this one is just uh, modeling the, uh, a healthy seagrass bed. Okay. So to do that, we've used a large amount of the elodia, the pondweed, to make it seem as though it's a large, healthy seagrass bed, um, just as the type that we'd like to see all over our waterways. Right, okay, so we've got a really healthy one here. So hopefully you guys have got the hang of this game, and it's got loads of sunlight, nice clear seas, like in Plymouth. Uh, let's see if it's higher or lower. Have we produced more oxygen 
or less oxygen. And it is. Wow, it's produced loads. Yes. So how comes it, how comes this happen? Well, absolutely. That large amount of pondweed or elodia in this experiment has been photosynthesizing at the same rate, but because there's so much of the plant, it's producing a much higher volume of oxygen in the given time. So right. we can see that as the effect that would happen to a really healthy seagrass bed would be photosynthesizing and therefore growing at a much faster rate. Sure. I mean that's really interesting. So. These are all look like they're big issues. Mm -hmm. What can we, the guys at home, what can we actually do about this? Well, for example, when it comes to things like anchor damage, um, this comes down to um, communication, effective communication, and letting people that own boats um, and recreational boat users to be aware of the essential nature of those seagrass beds, and more importantly, the location of those seagrass beds. By communicating that information and making people aware, they'll be more inclined to reduce their impact by either not throwing their anchors in that area or mooring using mooring buoys, which will prevent that scouring effect of their dragging anchor chains and cutting down that essential seagrass plant. Brilliant. Okay, um, so the next one. I listen to the Wurzels, but I'm not a farmer. And I'm sure some of the guys at home <laughs> are the same. I'm sure they're into the Wurzels. Um, what can we do? about this one, about the NPK? Yeah, the eutrophication is a big issue. That fertiliser runoff um, affecting that overgrowth of algae, you might think, well, I can't do anything about that one, but it's actually quite straightforward. All you need to do is be considerate of where your plants and your food's coming from. So maybe buying organic where you can, or better yet, grow your own. We've just shown you how to grow some plants and create your own kitchen garden. So plant some seeds and that way you know you're not having an impact on that runoff of agricultural fertilizers causing overgrowth of algae which is smothering our seagrass beds. Yeah I mean getting hold of some cress seeds is, is <laughs> ask for it for your birthday. Get some cress seeds, make them up, you can have them on a sandwich, egg and cress sandwich, top notch. Healthy diet. Yeah exactly. <laughs> so sedimentation I don't own a, 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 a dredging company, mm -hmm. what can I do about this? Well, this one is actually probably the most straightforward one because nature's got this. When it comes to erosion, nature has all the systems in place that it needs to prevent runoff of sediment and build up of sediment in our waterways because it's got trees and root systems that are in place holding those riverbanks in and making sure there's not an over erosion of those waterways. Unfortunately, what's happening is development and commercialization of areas is leading to destruction of those green pathways and those green areas and development of roads and buildings. And that means that there's no root systems in place, erosion exponentially increases and runoff of sediment is a problem. All you guys need to do is to use your green spaces. And not only that, let your councillors know that that park or that play area or that football field is vital for you. If you're using those green spaces, then your councillors will know and they will be less inclined to build on it and leave nature then to do what it does best, which is keep everything in balance. What, so you mean the best thing I can do is go and have a picnic, play some football and then make sure I get it up on social media? Yeah, make sure you tell your local policymakers all about it. Brilliant, okay, I can do that. Cool. Um, and that way we'll have healthy seagrass beds. Fantastic. So, what a great way to end our live lesson today. Um, so, the three main topics we wanted to look at today. We wanted to find out about the structure of seagrass. Uh, we found out about that it's made up of flowers. It has, it has flowers on the only, it is the only flowering plant underneath the ocean, which I think is absolutely brilliant. We, it has a complicated rhizome system um, and with, then we also went on to find out about how to sow seeds, that was awesome, and a little bit more about things that you guys can do at home. Uh, then with me we went and had a little look at uh, the process of photosynthesis and the chemical reaction that takes place and then finally we looked at how, that, how, we can, how nature sometimes changes or humans can alter the amount of photosynthesis is taking place and how we can do something about that which I think is brilliant. Excellent. Now that you all know about seagrass and you've met our very good friend seagrass uh, and you know how it's involved in photosynthesis, 
Join us for our next live lesson, which is going to tell you all about how that seagrass is essential in the carbon cycle.